Bench power supplies are probably the least exciting device to cover, despite the fact that every electronic project uses them. Now, I said that to say Digilent and the Element 14 community sent me a DPS 3340 to check out. Other than a power switch, it is a power supply that has no controls because it is USB based. So in this video, we look at its capabilities, test how it performs, do one crazy trick in waveforms, and cover a few things I'll call trade-offs. My name is James and welcome back to Workbench Wednesdays. Let's go review. The DPS3340 is a triple output supply. All three channels are variable. C1 goes up to positive 5 volts and 3 amps. C2 goes down to negative 15 and C3 goes up to positive 15 with both of those each capable of 500 milliamps. All three channels share a common ground across the two ground posts. On the back is the USB port, barrel jack for input power and a reset switch. The unit measures about 24 by 20 by four centimeters and weighs about 722 grams. Well, over a kilogram if you include the power supply. Like other discovery tools from Digilent, the DPS is controlled from the waveform software, which looks slightly different with just the supply connected. The supply's instrument is the primary interface. Each output channel has its own voltage and current limit. There are virtual LEDs for when the supply is in constant voltage or current mode. Strangely, the CV mode has a red indicator in software, but a green indicator on the hardware. Channels two and three can track each other. Each supply has independent output control along with the main enable. You also have the ability to set protections like a fuse or over voltage. The readouts appear as text boxes and a chart with configurable history. The meter instrument is like the oscilloscope instrument from the analog discovery tools. These waveforms are the voltage and currents of each supply sampled at one kilohertz. However, this is not a general purpose oscilloscope. That means you cannot connect signals to it and measure those. And the WaveGen tool configures the supply channels as a very low frequency waveform generator. You can select up to 250 hertz, but the software warns about bandwidth limitations above 50. The DPS works with the Analog Discovery tools. Physically, it fits nicely with the Analog Discovery Pro, but it works with the two or three as well. Once both are connected to your computer, you configure them as a select plus dual pair. Now the virtual instruments available are a combination of the two. You can use the supply built into the Analog Discovery or a Discovery PS tool controls the DPS. At the time of this video, the DPS 3340 cost 495 US dollars. Next, let's take some performance measurements. Using this 470 ohm or 466 ohm resistor, I attach it directly to the power supply post. Ohm's law says this should draw 10.7 milliamps at 5 volts. In waveforms, I set the voltage to 5 and the current limit to 12 milliamps. However, it looks like we're only drawing 9. So I connected the resistor with a bench DMM and it showed 10.69 milliamps as expected. I'll come back to that difference later. First, let's talk about the ripple voltage. I attached a scope probe to the resistor and enabled the DPS output. On the scope, we see a waveform. We are looking at the periodic and random disturbances or PARD or ripple voltage. The oscilloscope measures 35 millivolts peak to peak, which is slightly higher than the specified less than 30 millivolts peak to peak. Now let's set the supply to its max of three amps. I set the electronic load to 1.67 ohms because with five volts, that should be 2.99 amps. And here the ripple voltage comes out to be around 50 millivolts peak to peak. But let's back up and notice a couple of things first. The load shows 2.811 amps and the DPS measures 2.809. So there's still a few milliamps of difference. I mean, it's not off by much, but it's off by about the same in both of those measurements. So I took a look at the calibration function available for the meters in the DPS. They are located in the device manager of waveforms, but it requires an approximate 833.333333 milliohm resistor. It's very weird for me to read the word about and then see six decimal places of precision. Regardless, I don't have one of those and this unit is brand new. So why would it need to be calibrated already? Anyway, regarding voltage, the DPS dropped to 4.898 volts, which is why the current came out low. The voltmeter on the load measures 4.694 volts, but that difference is because of the voltage drop across the cables. Now let's drop the load's resistance to get 2.99 amps out of the supply. 
which only increase the ripple by a few millivolts. The more interesting part is the waveform that occurs when you hit the 3 amp limit. It becomes a bit funky. Like other low cost power supplies, keep that behavior in mind if you plan to drive them at their maximums. Next, I attached two 43 ohm resistors to the 15 volt supply. In waveforms, let's switch to channel 3 and set its current to be the maximum of 500 milliamps and then an output of 10 volts. Now we're seeing 470 milliamps. On the scope, we see a mean of 9.95 volts and a ripple that agrees with the less than 25 millivolts peak to peak spec. Actually, I forgot to clear the scope when making that measurement, so it was actually only measuring about 22 millivolts peak to peak. Now granted, that was at 10 volts. To measure at 15 volts, I switched to the electronic load. Drawing about 490 milliamps, the ripple was between 30 to 40 millivolts peak to peak. As I lowered the resistance, the ripple increased to 100 millivolts. So it looks like we can cleanly get about 490 millivolts out of the 15 volt supply. Ripple or PARD is very difficult to measure correctly, and frankly, Digilent did not provide any details on the conditions they used. So I think these values are reasonable, especially considering three things. When I used the probe's ground spring off camera, I saw slightly less ripple in all of the measurements as I would expect. Also, I am using a 10 to 1 probe, which will add some noise. Now, even though this probe is specified as 60 megahertz, it only applies in the 10 to 1 setting. Switchable probes like these only get a few megahertz of bandwidth in their 1 to 1 setting. And in power supply measurements, you usually want 20 megahertz. Also, electronic loads are reactive devices, so they tend to create extra ripple because of how they work. Again, I think my numbers came out on the slightly high side due to my measurement methods. Okay, next, let's take a look at the fuse setting. Software settable fuses are different from the constant current limit. With constant current, the supply lowers its output voltage while limiting the current to the set value. Fuses, however, turn off the output if they get tripped. I built this switch circuit to test the fuse. The large resistor constantly draws about 10 milliamps. Pressing the buttons should add about 100 milliamps of current draw. Now for the rest of these tests, let's use the Analog Discovery Pro as the oscilloscope. Anyone else starting to get Sega 32X vibes? With the fuse disabled and the current limit set to 1 amp, I press the button. On the scope instrument, the orange waveform is the 5 volt supply and the blue waveform is the voltage across the small resistor. So when the button is pushed, the 5 volt rail briefly drops and then recovers in about 100 nanoseconds. Next, in the supply, let's change the channel fuse. Select immediately for the timeout and set the maximum current to 50 milliamps. Of course, last, I enable the supply and start the oscilloscope. Now when I press the button, the supply turns off. The scope trace shows it took about 600 microseconds for the channel to turn off and then some time for the voltage to decay. Zooming into the shutdown event, we can see how the supply behaved like it did before. It turned on and let the load draw 110 milliamps before tripping the fuse. By the way, I have a much more expensive power supply with a similar feature and it takes much longer to trip its soft fuse. Related, let's talk about turning on all three outputs at the same time. Using these BNC to banana adapters, I connected all three channels to the Analog Discovery Pro's analog inputs. The supplies are set for their maximum voltage and the oscilloscope is scaled the same for each. Using normal sweep, the scope will only trigger when C1 turns on. And it looks like C2 turns on right before C3, followed by C1 about 2 milliseconds later. Slowing down the time base, we can see that they take about 25 to 30 milliseconds to reach their full voltage. By the way, changing the current limit does change the behavior just a little bit, but in general, that's the order I always saw. Oh, and before I forget, I did account for the delay of the cables. I measured with all three cables connected to the same output on the supply. And on the oscilloscope, the waveforms overlapped, showing that they were de-skewed close enough. Astute viewers might have noticed that I only had one ground lead connected. Check out this magic trick. I removed the only ground connection and then was able to repeat the test exactly the same way. Now, if you recall at the beginning, I said that all channels share a common ground. Well, it turns out that that statement literally meant ground. Most bench supplies have floating outputs, which means the negative terminal is not directly connected to earth ground. However, the DPS negative is referenced to earth ground. 
This lack of channel isolation means you cannot put the channels of the DPS in series with each other or in series with another bench supply. It also means you have to be careful when using an oscilloscope or other test tools because touching their ground in a live circuit can cause a short. By the way, these units are not isolated from the computer either. Is this a huge deal breaker? I mean, no, not really. For low voltage stuff, you end up connecting the ground to say the scope or PC anyway. It just caught me off guard that these supplies were not isolated. It is the only bench supply I have ever had in my lab without floating outputs. Now related but different, regarding safety, the outputs are isolated from AC mains through the brick supply. A missing feature is remote turn on. Other supplies have digital inputs that let you control the output channels with external signals. For example, that signal could come from other test equipment or a microcontroller or a push button. Even though the DPS does not have those inputs, there is one trick that we can do. When using the supply with an analog discovery, you can use one of its digital inputs. You will need to write some JavaScript code, but it can monitor the digital I.O. pin for a signal and then activate the power supplies, like when I push this push button. Frankly, I am surprised that this is not built into waveforms already. This last thing is a little bit of a nitpick. The front panel indicators are weak. So just looking at the supply, it is not always clear what channels are currently on. The CV and CC lights help, but they're not very bright unless you look straight on and with a well-exposed camera shot. So who should be looking at the DPS 3340? Well, I would give it consideration if you need less than 30 watts for your applications or need low current positive and negative supplies or have limited space on your bench or you are already using analog discovery tools and or you want to take advantage of the scripting capabilities in waveforms. Hey, thanks for watching. Check the link below for show notes on the Element 14 community. You'll find lots of great stuff over there. If you want to see more videos from me or the other host, tap or click the things on the screen. For now, it is time for me to get back to my electronics workbench.